Hey, Dr. O here, and I've put together this uh, three-page uh, mini PowerPoint to help you organize the endocrine hormones and uh, figure out who is signaling who and what the ultimate effects are. So on these next few slides, I'm going to fill in these um, this chart with you. So let's get started. So one of the challenges of learning the endocrine system is keeping the hormones straight. Uh, who's making them, what hormone it is, where it's going, and what's its ultimate effects. Um, so I, I made these series of flow charts to help students sort these things out. So with this one, the focus is on the anterior pituitary, the hormones that it makes, and what are the end results. So uh, because my end results are kind of sketchy here, I'll help you go through these so you can fill these things in. All right. So let's start with a simple one. Let's look at milk production. So we need to ask ourselves, if we want milk production, what hormone is released by the anterior pituitary that will ultimately lead to that? And uh, right here, I'm looking for the hormone. The H stands for hormone, and the G stands for the gland that that hormone is going to act on. So our anterior pituitary is a gland. It's going to release a hormone. In this case, in order to get milk, we're going to release the hormone prolactin. Now, where does prolactin go? Prolactin's target gland is going to be the mammary glands. And once they've been acted on by prolactin, we're going to end up with milk production. Let's look at the column to the right of this, the one that deals with bone and muscle growth. So what hormone does the anterior pituitary release that's ultimately going, going to lead to bone and hormone growth? Well, that's pretty simple. It's going to be growth hormone. Now, there's actually a whole lot more to this, but I really wanted to keep the focus on the flow of um, hormone being released from the anterior pituitary and the what's involved to getting that end result. So for now, we're going to leave it as this. But there's more to this, just so you know. All right, let's come over here and let's look at this one that deals with kidneys, glucose, and libido. What is that all about? Well, when I say kidneys, what I'm talking about is the release of a hormone called aldosterone. Aldosterone works on the kidneys. It has to do with um, moving fluid out of the filtrate created by the kidneys and restoring it back to the blood in order to maintain blood volume and ultimately blood pressure. What do I mean by glucose? Well, this particular organ also makes a hormone called cortisol. And cortisol helps with blood sugar management during times of stress. And libido, what's up with that? Well, this hormone also makes a little bit of androgen, which is a precursor to testosterone, which drives libido. Testosterone drives libido in both men and women. Women don't need a lot of it. But here it is. So who's going to make all of this? Well, actually, it's going to be the adrenal glands that do this, specifically the adrenal cortex. So what hormone does the anterior pituitary release that is going to go to the adrenal cortex? Well, hopefully you said that that is going to be the adrenocorticotropic hormone. I know that's a mouthful. That's why we abbreviate it ACTH, adrenocortical, cortex of the adrena, adrenal gland. I think I just butchered that, but I'm going to go with it. <laughs> because I've done this like three times already. Um, all right, so where does the ACTH go? It goes to the adrenal cortex. And when I was going over all of these things with the kidneys, the aldosterone, the, gl the glucose, the cortisol, the libido, the androgens, that's what we're going to list right here in this line above it. So aldosterone is going to go to work on the kidneys, cause the uptake of water to help maintain blood volume and blood pressure as a result. Cortisol causes glucose levels to be maintained high in the body so that the body can have a resource to call on during times of stress. Androgens, sex hormones basically, drives libido largely. That's not all it does, but we can distill it down to that so that you give your hat, yourself a, something to hang your hat on with regards to ACTH. 
So when the anterior pituitary releases ACTH, its destination is the adrenal cortex, and it can trigger these things out of the adrenal cortex. All right, cellular metabolism. Boy, that's a broad one. And the reason why I just leave it at cellular metabolism is because virtually every cell in the body has a receptor for this hormone. And I'm going to tell you it has to do with the thyroid gland. So I'm going to go ahead and click the gland first. All right, so the gland. So what hormone does the anterior pituitary release that stimulates the thyroid? Well, how about TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone? So when thyroid stimulating hormone goes down to the thyroid and stimulates it, what does the thyroid release? Well, actually, the thyroid releases a couple of things, and we can call them different things, but mostly we call them T3 and T4. It's the hormone that is going to basically trigger every cell in the body to do its cellular activity. It's like the, the, the go flag at a, a racetrack. All right, now I've got a couple of things here, the um, supporting gametes and the sperm and egg. I'm going to go with sperm and egg production because the sperm and egg production, the hormone that the anterior pituitary releases that is specific to the production of sperm and egg is follicle stimulating hormone. Now the, 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 the target of follicle stimulating hormone are going to be the gonads. And I've got two glands listed. Um, if you're a female, it's going to be the ovaries. If you're a male, it's going to be the testes. Now, what hormone is that going to trigger? Well, in the case of the female, follicle stimulating hormone is going to trigger the ovaries to make estrogen. In the case of the male, follicle stimulating hormone is going to trigger the testes to make testosterone. So when I say two glands and two hormones, they're going to be specific um, to a male and a female. All right, so that is specific to sperm and egg production. Now, the other hormone that gets released by the anterior pituitary largely does supporting activities of the gametes. And there's a whole lot that could be said about this, but I am making a big, big generalization when I say supporting the gametes, because we can think about this other uh, hormone um, working in conjunction with follicle stimulating hormone and where follicle stimulating hormone is focused strictly on creating those those sex cells the other hormone is basically making sure that the condition in the ovaries and the testes are just fine uh, to move things forward. And that other hormone that I'm talking about is luteinizing hormone. And it too is going to have its effects on the ovaries and the testes. And it's going to trigger the ovaries and the testes um, to make, there's gonna be two hormones produced by the female, one produced by the male. In the case of the female, uh, she's going to be making estrogen and progesterone. So luteinizing hormone is largely responsible for the production of, well, almost entire, entirely responsible for the production of progesterone. We'll still have estrogen being made. And then it's going to trigger the male to make testosterone as well. So this is how you can begin to think about the anterior pituitary and the six hormones that are being released by the anterior pituitary, where those hormones are going, and if it's going to a gland, what those glands are going to be triggered to do next. And in some case, it's most cases, it's going to be making another hormone to get the effect that's desired. And in one case, um, we're going to end up with just a product right here. And then in this other case, we're just going to end up with a direct effect on some tissues. Okay, let's take a look at the other flow chart that I have for you. Now, this hormone is going to encourage you to have an understanding about the relationship that the hypothalamus has with the anterior pituitary and triggering it to do certain things.
And you'll notice down here at the bottom, I've listed out testosterone and estrogen, um, mineral corticoids, glucocorticoids, androgens. Um, mineral corticoids is going to be your um, aldosterone. Glucocorticoids is going to be cortisol. T3, T4, we just learned that has to do with um, the thyroid gland. We've got milk production. And then I've filled in a little bit more about growth factor. So that's what we're dealing with here. Now, hypothalamus is going to communicate with the anterior pituitary in either in one of two ways. It's either going to be a releasing hormone or an inhibiting hormone. And we have two scenarios where we create an inhibiting hormone. So that's why we have a couple of blanks down here. Okay. So let's just follow this first pathway all the way through. So when the hypothalamus wants the anterior pituitary to release some hormones that are going to trigger the release of um, uh, testosterone and, and estrogen, basically what the uh, hypothalamus is going to release are gonadotropic releasing hormones. Gonadotropic releasing hormone. So that goes down to the anterior pituitary. And then that's going to trigger the anterior pituitary to release follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. So we don't release those two independent of each other. We release them together. Now, the amounts that get released are going to vary depending upon the feedback mechanisms, but we don't need to know all of that detail. We just need to know that when the hypothalamus picks up that we need to bol bolster our testosterone levels or our estrogen levels, hypothalamus is going to release gonadotropin releasing hormone. It's going to go down to the anterior pituitary and in response to that, the anterior pituitary is going to release follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. And from our previous slide, we know that those two hormones are going to go down and they're going to work on the ovaries and the testes. All right, let's look at the next next column. So here we're looking at mineral corticoids, mineral corticoids, glucocorticoids, and androgens. So this is uh, the focus here is going to be on the adrenal cortex. So let's just go ahead and drop that in. Now, we hopefully remember from the previous slide that in order to get um, the anterior pituitary and the adrenal cortex to communicate, we're going to be releasing ACTH. So what's going to trigger the anterior pituitary to release ACTH? What can the, um, the hypothalamus release to trigger the anterior pituitary to release ACTH? Well, it's going to be corticotropic releasing hormone. So when the hypothalamus picks up that we need something from the adrenal cortex, it's going to release corticotropic releasing hormone. That'll go down to the anterior pituitary. The anterior pituitary reads the note and says, oh, you want me to release some ACTH. I can handle that. And then off we go. Now, here we're looking at uh, the goal of releasing T3 and T4. Well, we know that T3 and T4 is going to come from the thyroid gland. And as we just saw from our previous slide, the thyroid gland is going to uh, receive a message from the anterior pituitary by way of the thyroid stimulating hormone. So what is going to be released from the hypothalamus that tells the anterior pituitary to release that TSH? Well, that's going to be thyrotropin releasing hormone. So we've, we've got three releasing hormones so far. Gonadotropin, um, uh, <laughs> this, this is all a mouthful. Uh, corticotropic releasing hormone and thyrotropin releasing hormone. All right. I'm going to skip this blank right here and go to the next one, which is milk production. Now, we know that the mammaries produce um, milk and that it comes by way of prolactin, which is released from the anterior pituitary. So we must have some sort of releasing hormone coming from the hypothalamus. So what would that be? Prolactin releasing hormone. But what if we didn't want to make any um, milk today? 
What do you think the, this is one of those uh, inhibiting hormones. Well, it would be prolactin inhibiting hormone, PIH, prolactin inhibiting hormone. It would be uh, intercepted by the anterior pituitary. And as a result of that, we wouldn't get any prolactin released, which means that the mammaries would not be stimulated to do anything. And as a result, we get nothing. So we don't really have that the inhibiting hormones when it comes to um, follicle stimulating hormone or adrenal uh, ACTH or TSH, but we do with uh, prolactin and largely the release of prolactin is under the influence of the inhibiting hormone. <laughs> Basically, the body says, we pregnant? Nope, not today. Not going to be making any milk. Releasing the prolactin inhibiting hormone. And then off we go. <laughs> so that's how that works. Let's take a look at the very last column. Now, this is going to be growth hormone. So we know that the anterior pituitary is going to release growth hormone. And growth hormone is um, going to basically, this is where I'm going to fill in some blanks. It's going to go to the liver. Believe it or not, growth hormone is going to go to the liver first. And the liver is going to release these um, secondary messengers known as, it's actually not a secondary messenger, but these other signaling molecules known as insulin-like growth factors. And that is ultimately what's going to stimulate the muscles and bone to grow. So growth hormone doesn't directly go to muscle and bone and tell it to grow. It goes first to the liver that says, yeah, we, we need to do some little growth business here. Can you like help us out? Because, you know, the liver is always up in everybody's business. And um, the liver says, sure, I'll release some insulin-like growth factors. And then that tells bone and muscle to grow. But how does the anterior pituitary know to release that? because it's receiving a releasing hormone coming from the hypothalamus. In fact, it is growth hormone releasing hormone. But what if we don't want so much growth hormone? Guess what? We got an inhibiting hormone, growth hormone, inhibiting hormone. Goes to the anterior pituitary and says, you know, we don't really need any, any today. So we don't make any growth hormone and we don't stimulate the liver to make insulin-like growth factors and we don't get any growth. So where our first slide tells us how the anterior pituitary communicates with um, the body, this slide is showing us how the hypothalamus communicates with the anterior pituitary and then, you know, what happens as a result of all of that. I got one more slide to go over and then I think you guys should be set as far as uh, figuring out what's happening in the body with hormones at least a little bit. Now what you're going to learn in this first module is that there are certain triggers for the release of hormones. And it can either be a hormonal stimuli, which basically means the release of one hormone triggers the release of another hormone, or the absence of a hormone triggers the release of another hormone, aka negative feedback. Um, it could be something in the blood that is humoral. We would call that humoral stimuli. So something in the blood is triggering the release of a hormone. I know that sounds crazy, but we're going to look at some uh, examples of that. I'll actually fill some things in on this chart. I think I can do that here. Can I do that? You know what? I don't think I can do that on this on this particular slide, uh, but I'll tell you what to do. Yeah, I can't do it easily. Um, and then we're going to have neural stimuli. We've only we've only got one that is included in the module. I can give you an example of a second one. Um, so um, let's look at an example. Well, actually, I do have um, an example of a neural right here on this slide already. So for example, you've got your sympathetic uh, input that will stimulate the adrenal medulla, not the adrenal cortex, but the medulla to release adrenal, uh, adrenaline or um, epinephrine. So this tells you that the stimulus is the uh, sympathetic input, fight or flight, response. The gland that is involved is the adrenal medulla and the adrenal medulla is releasing adrenaline. Now you could get really detailed in here and actually talk about what adrenaline does, which, you know, dilates the pupils, makes the heart rate go up, um, breathing rate increases, 
diverts blood out to the muscles, you can actually get that level of detail. It just depends upon how it works for you and your brain. Uh, I wanted to keep this pretty, pretty broad so that you could fill it in however you needed to. Uh, and another example of neural stimulus has to do with the suckling reflex. So um, when it comes to producing milk, you've got a couple things that have to happen. First of all, you have to have um, prolactin being released from the anterior pituitary going down to the mammary glands and telling them to make, um, make milk. And then you have to have oxytocin being released as part of the letdown reflex so that the milk can be ejected and the baby can get it. So um, you have to have both of those things happening. But how, does, how, do, how do we get that stimulation? Well, actually, the, the, the act of the baby suckling at the breast can trigger the release of prolactin. Certainly, hormone levels are going to play a role in that. But the act of suckling at the breast is a positive feedback loop. It's a neural stimulus that will um, act on um, so will act on the uh, anterior pituitary to cause the release of prolactin and then ultimately leads to the production of milk. So you could say here the neural stimulus is the act of suckling at the breast, uh, the gland involved, you could either say anterior pituitary slash mammary gland, and then the action result is uh, prolactin from the anterior pituitary slash milk from the mammary gland. That's an example of that. All right, let's talk about a humoral stimulus. Now, um, I'm going to go to insulin, the release of insulin, because the pancreas, pancreas is a great little organ, and uh, it's it does a lot of stuff for us. And one of the things the pancreas does is it's got like a little chemistry lab set up in there, and it's taking samples of the blood, and it's figuring out all kinds of amazing things in the blood. And the thing that it's looking at is blood glucose levels. So if our blood glucose levels increase, that's our stimulus, blood glucose levels increase, then the pancreas picks up on that. So the pancreas will in turn release insulin that causes glucose to be taken up by the cells. So then the cells can use that to make ATP. Let's talk about another one. Blood calcium levels. Let's talk about blood calcium levels either being too high or too low. Both of these are humoral stimulation. What if your blood calcium level is too high? Well, that's your stimulus. Blood calcium level is really high, very robust. Well, the body's like thrilled with that. And you have uh, the thyroid gland that has its own little chemistry lab set up in there. And it's monitoring the upper, the upper level of, uh, of, blood of blood calcium levels. And when it detects that we've got robust blood calcium levels, it's going to, the thyroid gland, is going to release a hormone known as calcitonin. So thyroid, we go here, calcitonin gets released. And what does calcitonin do? do? Calcitonin tones the bones. It basically causes that extra calcium to be deposited into bones. Well, what happens on the other end of the spectrum if blood calcium level is too low? That's your stimulus. Blood calcium level is too low. Well, that's not being monitored by the thyroid gland. Thyroid gland is only monitoring the upper level of blood calcium levels. But the gland that is monitoring the lower levels, parathyroid hormone. And what does a parathyroid hormone do when blood calcium levels get too low? It releases parathyroid hormone. And parathyroid hormone has a three-pronged three -pronged approach. I'll give you a minute to write this down. Or you can just pause the video. Why don't we go with that? Just pause the video. The first thing it's going to do is go to the osteoclasts in the bone and cause them to break down bone and release calcium from bone into the blood. The next place it's going to have its effect is in the kidneys. And it's going to do a couple of things in the kidneys. One of the things that parathyroid hormone is going to do in the kidneys is going to cause calcium to be extracted from uh, the filtrate that is destined to become urine. 
So parathyroid goes down to the little filtration units in the kidney and says, hey, got any calcium in there? Because we really want to hang on to it. Can you pull that out for me? Toss it back into the bloodstream. Fabulous. The other thing that parathyroid hormone is going to do is it's going to trigger the kidneys to turn the inactive form of vitamin D into the active form of vitamin D. And when that happens, that gets released into the bloodstream, and then that's going to go over to the intestines. This is the third thing. The intestines are going to pull out calcium from whatever is in the intestines and dump it into the bloodstream. And all three of those actions, the osteoclast, the kidneys pulling calcium out of filtrate, and then the vitamin D helping pull calcium out of the intestines, are going to help increase blood calcium levels. So those are some examples of humoral stimulation. Some organ is monitoring something in the blood, and that's causing the release of a hormone. Now, most of the um, interactions between, in fact, all the interactions between the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary, those are all hormonal interactions. Every single one of those. So when the anterior pituitary, excuse me, when the hypothalamus releases uh, a releasing hormone or an inhibiting hormone, that is hormonal stimulation directly to the anterior pituitary. When the anterior pituitary releases one of its six hormones and it does whatever it does, that is a hormonal stimuli to whatever the target is. So there's any number of things that you could put here. So you could put uh, communication between the, the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary, whatever that may be. Or you could say uh, anterior pituitary um, release, you have a uh, um, low thyroid hormone levels, T3, T4 levels are low. Um, I would just say anterior pituitary releases TSH to increase that. So, you know, there's any number of um, hormonal stimuli examples that you could utilize. So I'm going to leave that one up to you, and I think that is plenty with this. All right, hope you found this useful.